Well, good evening. Welcome to Space Holidays. Thank you for joining us on this Monday evening. We've got a, a, a packed program tonight for you. But before I say that, I hope everybody's well. And I uh, hope you've all been out looking at the Perseid meteor shower. I managed to grab an hour the other night. Uh, it should have been clear all night, according to the forecast. And that was the peak night, 12th, 13th. And uh, lasted for an hour before a big bank of grey cloud rolled in from the east, and that put paid to that for the night. But did get to see some bright meteors, and I was especially thrilled because my daughter saw her first meteors, which was uh, absolutely amazing. So um, what have we got for you today? Well, we're delighted to welcome as our special guest uh, this evening. Well, we've got two special guests for you this evening, actually. Told you it was a packed program. Uh, we, we've got uh, here with us now. Smiling away there is Dave Saras. Welcome, Dave, from uh, NPAE, which he's going to tell us all about a little later. Dave has uh, joined us before when we were on Astro Radio, so he's an old friend of the uh, the channel. And we've also got the illustrious Mark Thompson, who will be joining us. And uh, let me just let him in because he's banging up that door. Uh, so uh, there, here we are. There you are, Mark. How are you? Hello. Good um, evening. How, how is how is my mic sounding? Am I all crappy? That's, 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 that's a lot better now. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. No. yeah. I don't know what you did, but you did it well. Yeah. So, Wonderful. There Thank we you. are. And uh, also like to introduce somebody who comes and goes. Uh, Daz, welcome back from three minutes ago. Who was it knocked you out this time? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> Can you hear us, Daz? Nope. Right. Oh, here we come. Insulted. Yeah. All oh, right, no, stop. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, as you know, Daz has an ongoing bandwidth problem and he comes and goes during the show, <laughs> but there we are. Anyway, um, yes, Monday night. Big thank you to those of you who bought us coffees last week. As always, uh, it goes into the coffers of Space Oddities to allow us to do things we need to do and want to do, so thank you very much. The generosity of you lot with buying us coffees is, is uh, absolutely amazing. So I would like to ask the panel to give a round of applause to everybody who's buying us coffees because their generosity is is a step. So, um, so thank you. And it does enable us to grow the channel and, and do you know whatever we like. And also, um, if, uh, uh, the usual quick plug: if you haven't bought your coveted Space Oddities T-shirts and hoodies, then you can do so. Uh, the link is in the description. But uh, but I will just uh, give you the quick uh, rundown now. The Space Oddities T-shirts are on sale now, uh, nineteen pounds, including UK postage and packing, which is a damn good price. And they're made of the highest quality materials. And you can be the first kid on your block to stun the world with your Space Oddities T-shirt. And how to get one of those? Well, you can you can scan the QR code here now if you want to rush off and buy one, which of course you do. Um, but if not, the link is in the description of the video. We've also got uh, for sale the most wonderful uh, Space Oddities hoodies. These, of course, are going to be a little bit more expensive, £35, including UK postage and packing. Two variations, a pullover one where the design is on the front and a zipper one where the design is on the back. Available, both available in a range of nine colours. And, uh, and again, you can scan the code or, or you can look in the description of the video where uh, the link is. And uh, we hope that you enjoy them because uh, I think we're all happy with our t-shirts, aren't we, guys? Don't all, don't all sound... <laughs> they all sound really convincing. Yeah, they're that. lovely. Great. 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 They're absolutely lovely. I don't have yeah. one. I have the hoodie. In fact, I'm going to put an order for two more. <laughs> the hoodie is really, really soft and snuggly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And if you do want to buy us a coffee, uh, then you can scan the QR code here. Um, and uh, yeah. And if you really love people, Christmas is coming up. You know what to buy. Yeah, not, not, no, coffee, not Christmas already. already. Coffee nut lattes. That's the way so, to go. Um, Christmas in so, the so not the same word already. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can you can do that. Hey, me trees up. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> Our tree doesn't come down. I think. Um, my wife gets attached to the Christmas tree. Well, not literally, but she loves the Christmas tree. And I think the latest we've ever taken it down is May. So, um, wow. so there we are. But that's, um, and why not? Life's too short to worry about stupid things like that. Okay. So we've got a good, a lovely news section coming up tonight. Uh, it'll be quite a long news section tonight because there have been some amazing stories in the news this week. And I just had to cover them. I can't let you, our viewers, go without knowing this stuff because some of it is going to blow your minds, I promise you, the stuff that we got this week. 
amazing. So we look forward to that. We've also got our regular features, of course, um, with, uh, with the gallery and Roger's Sky Guide. So we've got those to look forward to as well. But without more ado, I think what we will do is have a chat with Dave. So Dave, um, who are you, where are you, and why are you, basically? <laughs> so um, I'm Dave. I'm the business development manager for NPay Precision Astro Engineering, which is a UK-based manufacturer of high-end telescope accessories. We design and produce all our own um, it, all our own equipment. So our stuff is very unique. As soon as you look at it, you realise it's not uh, the normal run-of-the-mill stuff that um, that like you can buy from everywhere else. Though you can actually buy it at Rother Valley Optics, of course, who I know is uh, the sponsor of Absolutely. Space Odysseys. So, as always, so I thought I'd get that plug in for them. Yes, we must always uh, thank our sponsor, Rother Valley Optics, as, as Dave said, for sponsoring us. Yes, indeed. So that's it. Uh, right, well, that was fairly short. <laughs> that's it, okay then. On to the next yeah, point. Okay. Um, so how did, you, how did you get interested in astronomy in the first place, Dave? Well, I think like a lot of people, I started as a child. Um, I lived um, out in the countryside and used to see the sky, obviously, in, in the evening and was always quite mesmerised by it. And it kind of like built up from there. I did want to be a professional astronomer and study astronomy at university, like, like a lot of people who get into astronomy um, via the same method. Uh, but unfortunately was tripped up by the mathematics. And um, though I did come out of university with a decent degree in chemistry, which set me up Not for later things. Not a real science then. Oh, right. Say again, sorry. Not a real science. <laughs> well, well, it depends who you Whoa, ask. Whoa, to discuss. <laughs> Controversy. <laughs> um, hey, that's the first time we've had yeah. guests call, eh? <laughs> hey, excellent. So, Can we cover the duel live? <laughs> so then... So then I, um, I I didn't become an astronomer, sadly, not not via that method, um, but it always maintained a keen interest in it. Um, and so after pursuing fame and fortune in the city of London, um, which I never really found in terms of being there, um, um, I would uh, get more into uh, my astronomy and set up NPay Precision Astro Engineering with an engineer that, that I met. And then we we kind of got stuck into it. And then now eight years down the road, we, we've done a lot of interesting stuff. You might have heard of a manufacturer called Vance Like Engineering, who was based in, in Colorado. About a decade ago, their facility burnt down, sadly in the wildfire and put them out of business but they were manufacturers of uh, high-end um, astrometric turrets where you put your eyepieces in them and you rotate them around right so we kind of picked up from where they left off and um, we've got we've done we've produced two turrets so far and we've got some more coming out later this year but it's been a great journey i've met some very very nice people, um, such as yourselves. Um, ah, you're too kind. <laughs> so so I, I, I get to do the shows. I, I generally is what is what I do. So I, I get to go to the Northeast Astro Fair in New York or some of the British Astronomical Association events, and they had a had a good one actually at last year here, very right here in Nottingham, which was which was good. Um, I've been to the Practical Astronomy Show. I've been to Astro Fest in um, London. Right. At the moment, we're supporting other events in different parts of the world um, via like an outreach program where we'll send equipment to the show and they'll have it at the show and then they send us back at the end. So at the moment, there's an Astro Fest going on in um, Queensland in Australia. So we've got some mm. equipment over there. And we were at a European show in Spain as well with some equipment um, uh, um, right at the end of last month. Right, right. So you fair to say you get about a bit then, Dave? Um, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. 
So uh, we, we, you know, we were chatting earlier, and uh, we'd love it if you could come back on a, a regular basis and um, absolutely keep us up to date about what's going on in the world of, of telescopes. Certainly, now, that very, would be great. very much like to. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. You see, the thing is, uh, Dave, we did a, a bit of a viewers survey uh, a few weeks back, and yeah. uh, one thing that our viewers did say was they'd like to uh, us to feature more about telescope hardware. So I thought, well, okay. you're the perfect man for the job. So oh, thank you very much. If you could do that for us, uh, I'm sure I, I, I can talk you through my telescope collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but why not? Why not? But you know, the, there is you know, there are so many people who want to get into astronomy, but in terms of equipment and hardware, it is all very confusing. You don't know where to start. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Once you get yeah. over the initial thing, which is what I always tell people, start with binoculars, and then you know, if you like that, yeah, if you're not okay with that, get your telescope. Uh, so you know, it would be good to have somebody like yourself, just you know, trying to really help our viewers to let them know what's available and what prices and whatever. That would be sure. great. You're very yeah. kind. Sir. There's there's a telescope for every pocket. Yes, that's right. Some of them are bigger than that as well. So um, yeah. Um, so um, so have you have you got anything um, coming out sort of in the near future with 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 uh, NPay or, or? We have we've invented a flip turret, which we have had available um, as a back order for the last few months. Um, the first one is in final testing. We've been, is going out to South Korea. And we're quite excited about this because it's it's effectively a new invention. So you you, you know what a flip mirror is, yeah. where it, the mirror inside the back of the diagonal will move up and down like this. Yeah. yeah. And it lets the light through to the camera at the end. Yeah. And you have an eyepiece on the top. So it's exactly like that, but it's got a rotating bezel attached to it. So you can have six either eyepieces or other accessories along with the flip mechanism, which will then access your camera. So, for example, you basically get so much more out of your telescope. Start the evening with some, you know, lunar planetary go on to deep sky because you've got everything, you know, all the different eyepieces you would need for that on, on the bezel. Yeah. And then you'd flip the mirror, switch to auto tracking, and then do your astrophotography while you're asleep in bed. Fantastic. Mm. That sounds a wonderful invention. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, let's, let's hope it's really successful for you. So where, where can people view your products? What's, what's the address of your website? We will put it in the description as well. It is npae.net. Easy, very easy. npae.net. So, um, so to see all this this wondrous technology, and, and all your your hardware is made in the UK. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. So uh, let let's let's support the UK in this. It's not often we see a telescope. Indeed, patriotic made. buying. That's what we need. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's fantastic, Dave. So the best of luck with that. It sounds an amazing invention. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people interested in that um, because it, it will save a lot of fiddling about, won't it? Indeed, so, yeah. Yeah, so that, that'll be wonderful. Great. And, and this, will, this will fit on what type of telescope? Is it going to be? Uh, large, large ones. Obviously, yeah, large. when you've got six eyepieces and a camera, yeah. it does weigh quite a bit. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's going to be for large telescopes. We make smaller accessories for smaller telescopes, but yeah. um, this one would be for something, you know, a, a, a permanent observatory setup, basically. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're not going to fit that on a three-inch refractor, are you? So, no. Dave, can I, can I ask a question, Dave? Um, sure. So the, the concept of it being a, a turret with a flip, it's a brilliant concept. Is it designed chiefly for multiple eyepieces or multiple cameras? Or, or could you um, use it's both? designed for a single camera with multiple eyepieces okay because the, the, there's uh, it's, uh, how on earth you'd get around the cabling problems i've got no idea but <laughs> uh, as someone yeah no, it would be to... single single camera for kind that's, of that reason i mean obviously yeah, yeah, absolutely but someone who's had a remote system before uh, one of the problems i have and niggles that i've got is that if you've got uh, a system which you've got a camera which is for deep sky work, let's say, yeah. and then there's 
uh, you know, an occultation of a moon of Jupiter or something happens um, or transit and you want, want planetary camera, you've then got to go and change the camera as opposed to just, uh, you know, yeah. switching the camera. Now, there's going to be cabling issues, I'm sure, but at least if it could go one way and then maybe flip between two, that would actually be really useful. Whether I've got no engineering sort of bones in my body whatsoever, whether it'd work, I've got no idea. But if something like that could be developed, I find that a lot of use. Yeah. No, I mean, the mirror that we use is one tenth wave. So mm. you can actually use it for astrophotography. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate the purists don't like using too many optics in their astrophotography, but at uh, one tenth wave when you're doing like a hundred image stack yes. it's not actually going to make that much difference no no brilliant sounds great yeah it does doesn't it, it sounds wonderful well the best of luck with that dave and, thank you very much um, and you know well, hopefully next time we chat i can show you a working version yeah that'd be great well you know you are welcome back here any monday you know where to find us now so just drop in thank you uh you know if, if you found you've got something of your own products you want to tell us or, or something about you know new telescopes on the market or whatever that that would be great because uh viewers we do listen to your requests and uh you know we do want to be a little bit more hardware orientated although you will appreciate in a you know a software environment like this on youtube uh doing live hardware stuff is not easy uh but uh, but we will do our very best for you because we do listen to you and we do appreciate all of you who who, who uh contributed to our, our viewers survey that we ran recently it's very kind of you we've got some good ideas about where we're going and what you want so there we are dave i uh, hope you'll stick around for the rest of the show yep uh, you i'll can, stay you can, i'll stay you tuned can leave if you want to sir but you, you're more than welcome to stay and we we hope to chat to you as well you know you can join in with the rest of us so there we are uh, thanks dave for being here and um i think uh looking at uh, what we've got coming up next what we're going to do now uh is to go over to the news now, as I said earlier, it's been uh, it's been really uh, full news week. Lots going on, lots of uh, interesting stuff. There's some really mind blowing stuff here tonight. So just give me a second to get set up, and I'll take you through um, through the news. While they uh, while while we're doing that, um, I'm trying to get onto the chat, but I can't get onto the chat. So if I disappear. That's because I'm trying to lo load YouTube in parallel with trying to talk to you as well. So if oh, I right. hit the wrong button right. and I've gone, um, fear not, I, I will be banned. I don't know why you can't get onto the chat. You should be able to. Mm, maybe I've been banned. You know. <laughs> yeah. But don't worry. I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll get on. Right. I'll infiltrate somehow. Okay. So here's the news for this week. Um, first, there's been a, I hope you can all see this. There's been a major uh, dark matter discovery which could prove to have enormous implications. Now, before we talk about the news item, what I thought might be nice is to give you all a bit of a background about dark matter so that you appreciate the news story. So what we'll do, i uh, just go through a little bit about dark matter. So we live in what's called the baryonic universe. And the baryonic universe simply means it consists of the particles that we're familiar with, protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, etc. And that's called the baryonic universe. Now, it used to be thought that this was everything in the universe, but it isn't, because it turns out that we've also got a huge amount, uh, about 95% of the matter in the universe, in fact, is, is dark matter. And as you probably know, dark matter is a type of matter that does not uh, emit electromagnetic radiation, doesn't absorb nor reflect electromagnetic radiation. And because of that, it's totally invisible and undetectable to us. It's often called the missing mass, but that is a misnomer because we know it's not missing. In fact, we know where it is. We just don't know what it is. So another way of saying dark matter is to say, look, we know where it is. We just don't know what it is. Um, I'm just going to give you an example that dark matter was first postulated by Fritz Zwicky back in the 1930s. And it helps to explain why galaxies rotate at the speed that they do, why they don't fall apart. Or, or spin apart, and um, this is a, the idea is that every galaxy is embedded in this sort of mass of dark matter, which stops it flying apart. I won't go too much into galaxies now because there's a lot to say about that. What I would want, want, want to demonstrate to you is this: this is the bullet cluster. This is a galaxy cluster, but in fact, it's two smaller clusters 
that are colliding at high speed. If you want the number, it's 1A0657.56, but you can find the bullet cluster in Google if you want to know more about this. This is what it looks like in visible light, as you see two smaller clusters coming together and they are colliding at very high speed. If we add in an X-ray image of this, taken with NASA's Chandra X-ray telescope, orbiting telescope, you can see that there is a huge amount of very, very hot gas. This is what you're looking at, this sort of orangey color uh, here represented. It, it, obviously, we can't see X-rays, so it's a, you know, somebody's choice of color to represent it. This indicates extremely high temperature gas particles that are colliding and therefore generating X-rays because they're so hot. But the bullet cluster is interesting because if you actually map where all the mass is in this image, you would expect it to be where the, uh, the gas is. But in fact, if we map the matter distribution in this, you can see these blue areas. And this is where the majority of the mass is in this cluster. It's not where you'd expect it to be. And when we look at these, where these blue areas are, again, it's a false color representation, obviously. But if you look at where the blue areas are, we don't see anything. So whatever is there in terms of mass is completely invisible to us. And this was really, a, it's meant to be a smoking gun for this dark matter. There's a mass of material there that we just cannot detect. Now, this is not the only galaxy cluster collision where we see this. Here are another four. Uh, the credits for these are given at the bottom right. But as you can see, the same thing. We've got the X-ray image in pink and the matter concentration in blue. And as you can see, in each case, the concentration of matter is not where the hot gas is, which is where you'd expect it to be. It's invisible matter that we cannot see. And the way that these, these blue areas are arrived at are through things like gravitational lensing and other ways to estimate uh, where the mass is in these clusters. So this has always been a bit of a strange thing, that whatever is in that, those uh, concentrations of matter is completely invisible and we cannot detect it with any means whatsoever. It's not emitting any sort of radiation like X-rays or gamma rays or microwaves or whatever. It's completely invisible. We can't detect it. And of course, this is dark matter. But lots of people said, well, look, if we can't detect it, if, if we just have no way of detecting it, are we sure that it's really there? Because if gravity behaved just a little differently to how we think gravity behaves, there'd be no need for this dark matter at all. And this has led to uh, the idea of the baryonic universe being deeply connected to something called MOND. Well, what is MOND? MOND stands for Modified uh, Newtonian Dynamics. And this is a way, basically, MOND says, what if gravity doesn't work in the same way everywhere, all the time and under all circumstances? What if we've got it wrong about gravity? Because there's a way uh, that you can take one of these MOND theories, and the, I have to say MOND is a whole class of theories, a whole zoo of different theories about how to make this work. But basically, um, you can take one of the MOND theories and you can make dark matter disappear altogether. So with MOND, with one of the classes of MOND theory anyway, there's actually no need for that dark matter. But where do we go from there? Well, Throughout the years, there have been a number of different candidates for what this dark matter actually is. Primordial black holes, MACHO, which stands for uh, massively ha uh, compact halo objects, believe it or not. Axions, sterile neutrinos, dark photons, the opposite of MACHOs, of course, which is WIMPs. Over the years, all of these explanations, for one reason or another, have been sort of fairly conclusively ruled out. And the only one that is left at the moment is axions. Now, axions are hypothetical particles that could form dark matter, but they are hypothetical. They've never actually been observed. So this could be yet another uh, explanation for the dark matter that uh, is ruled out. So I think we're running out of different ways of making dark matter. And this has led an increasing number of people to look at MOND and say, 
yeah, is there something wrong with our understanding of gravity? Perhaps we don't need dark matter to explain the things that we do. So it comes down to two possibilities. You've got the baryonic universe with dark matter. This predicts most of what we see in the universe, but after decades, we haven't been able to identify it. The only thing we managed to do really with dark matter is to narrow down, if you like, the range of mass that it sits in. But other than that, basically, we haven't got a clue what it is. But Mond, on the other hand, says perhaps you don't need it. But Mond actually fails to predict some of the observations, like, for example, what happens in the galaxy clusters colliding that we saw earlier. So there's no observational evidence, in fact, that gravity can behave in this strange way, this so-called non-Newtonian manner. But this week came news of something really exciting. Enter Gaia, Europe's fantastic uh, spacecraft observatory that's sitting out at L2 along with the JWST. Gaia is mapping with exquisite precision about a billion stars in our galaxy, and already it's made some momentous discoveries, uh, which we'll talk about at another time. We must do a special about Gaia and what it's discovered because it's, it's so interesting. But the story originates from Gaia's data. And Gaia has looked at, um, in its catalogue, it has 26,500 wide binary systems now. Let's answer that question. So what is a wide binary? Well, a wide binary is a pair of stars that are co-orbiting that are separated by at least 7,000 astronomical units. That's uh, one astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So to classify as a wide binary, it's got to be at least these two stars in the system have got to be at least 7,000 times the Earth-Sun distance apart. Also, because they're so far apart, relative to each other, they're moving really slowly. And um, the examples were looked at, they are moving at about 0 0.1 nanometers per second. So barely perceptible movement because they're so far apart, they're moving this slowly relative to each other. Now, um, in more than 20,000 out of the 26,500 cases, binary companions were accelerating 30 to 40 percent faster than the acceleration expected according to Newton. So in other words, according to the Newtonian gravity we're all familiar with, these wide binaries relative to each other are moving 30 to 40 percent faster. This cannot be explained with Newtonian gravity, the gravity that we always assumed was the same throughout the universe. The ones that holds these binary systems together, uh, you know, Newtonian gravity is, is everything. It's the clockwork of the universe, if you like. It's how orbits work. It's how spacecraft are sent to distant planets and arrive at the right place at the right time. So Newtonian gravity works, but is there a possibility that under some circumstances it doesn't? And if so, this is major news. So the, the hero of the piece is Professor Chu Hyung Chai, he said mangling the name, from Seong University in Seoul. And he and his colleagues have done this study. And um, this is what they found, that, um, that there's something really strange going on. Now, it's not the first study to come up with these results. Uh, four years ago, there was another paper that was released that looked at a much smaller sample of wide binaries, only 81 out of the famous Hipparchos catalogue. And they found that their results are consistent with the Newtonian prediction for projected separations of less than 7,000 astronomical units but they're inconsistent with Newtonian gravity at larger separations. And their conclusion was that the result challenges Newtonian gravity at low accelerations. This was forgotten about, this study, until this week. So you've got two studies now, one on a small scale, one on a large scale, saying, hang on, there's something non-Newtonian going on in these systems. Enter at this point uh, Professor Mordechai Milgram of the Weizmann Institute in Israel. Forty years ago, he and a colleague, uh, the late Jacob 
Bekenstein came up with a MON theory that they called ACRL, um, and I won't bore you with that, what that stands for. They said in these wide binaries with this MON theory they came up with, the modified Newtonian gravity, that there should be an acceleration boost in these wide binaries of 1.4 times, and that is exactly what has been found. So this, again, reinforces the findings from, um, from Searle that there is definitely something going on with, with, uh, with these measurements. Now, if uh, Professor Che is right, and these uh, results do have an excess of a five sigma certainty, and otherwise they pass uh, any test that you could level where it, there might be equipment error or faults in the measurements or bad calculations or whatever. This is with a five sigma degree of certainty or more. Um, if this is true, we're going to have to rethink gravity because it doesn't apply the same everywhere in the universe under all circumstances for reasons as yet unknown. And it does have huge implications for dark matter, but not just for dark matter, for dark energy as well. So it impacts on that. And something else, in a lot of MON theories, there's this thing called the EFE, the external field effect, relating particularly to our galaxy, the Milky Way. And the aqua model that made this prediction of a 1.4 times acceleration requires the external field effect to be present. Um, and if it isn't, it doesn't work. So this has not only implications for dark matter and dark energy, but other theories about modified Newtonian gravity as well. You can see why this has been a big story uh, this week. It could well be that in the universe we have two components. We have dark matter, that dark matter does exist, but under other circumstances, under particular circumstances, we have MOND. Um, and some astronomers and astrophysicists are saying, well, it could be that we have a mixture of things going on, but what that mixture is and why it is as it is, we don't know yet. So just to take away from this, um, it, it appears that gravity does not behave as Newton, Newton predicted at low accelerations. The normal gravity we're used to doesn't impact that in any way at all, but under these very specific low acceleration circumstances, Newton uh, doesn't work. And the observations are exactly in line with this uh, aqual mond theory from 40 years ago, developed by Professor Milgram and, and Mr. Beckenstein. Uh, huge implications for dark matter and possibly dark energy as well. More data is needed, obviously. But if it bears out, this will be a major dent in current thinking about dark matter. And it may eventually turn out that we don't need dark matter at all. And it's only the exquisite accuracy and precision of these observations from Gaia which has made these observations possible. Uh, and they weren't before Gaia because we didn't have uh, the uh, telescope to measure these, uh, the accelerations of these binaries uh, to the accuracy required to make these measurements. So there you are. So that's the major story of the week. Um, really exciting. And uh, I will, of course, keep you updated on that. So what else has been going on this week? Well, look at this. The James Webb Telescope has looked at Ganymede and Io. And on the left, we have Ganymede in, uh, in, in the white light spectrograph from the James Webb. And on the right hand side, that incredibly volcanic moon Io from Jupiter in the near infrared. And you can see at the poles of Ganymede, we've got H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. And this is thought to be due to charged particles from Jupiter slamming into the ice at the poles of Ganymede. Uh, but that does require uh, a magnetic field uh, to make it. And of course, we know that Ganymede is the only moon in the solar system that has its own magnetic field. But these are lovely images anyway. And it just shows that the web is uh, an exquisitely powerful instrument, not just for looking at early galaxies in the universe, but for looking far closer to home. So there we are. There's some images from the web this week. Uh, this is a story I've been meaning to cover for a while. There may be huge quantities of water lying about on the surface of the moon. Now, this was a discovery made by uh, China's 
Chang'e 5 sample return mission, which took samples from the lunar surface and returned them to the Earth successfully. And what it found was that there were these little glass beads lying everywhere on the moon's surface, everywhere, that are full of water. It's unbelievable. And the estimates are that over the whole surface of the moon, there may be 300 billion tons of water locked up in these glass beads. Now, where the hell did the beads come from and how did they form? They are the result of collisions with the moon, uh, not surprisingly. And the idea is you have a, a small asteroid or a large rock which contains water hitting the surface, uh, turning molten, and the water gets trapped in the molten droplets. And then those molten droplets solidify later into glass and they're left all over the surface. This is major news for the human exploration of the moon because it means we may not have to go to the lunar south pole to find this ice that's locked up in the permanently dark craters there. There may be water just lying everywhere on the surface that we can just scoop up these beads and extract the water from. Uh, so this is a pretty, pretty important discovery as well. And uh, we obviously need more data on this, but this is what China seems to have found. Very exciting. Artificial intelligence is coming on in leaps and bounds. There's a new artificial intelligence called a HelioLink 3D, and it succeeded in finding a hazardous uh, Earth-threatening asteroid, which is 600 feet across. But this had been completely missed by humans. Artificial intelligence found it, which is the first time this has ever been done. And this is especially exciting because these software algorithms in the HelioLink 3D AI have been written for the Vera Rubin Observatory, which sees first light in Chile. I think the latest estimate is uh, 2025. It's currently under construction in Chile. This is an amazing survey telescope, which will alert us to more uh, Earth crossing asteroids than it's been possible to do up to now. And the advent of this AI software will mean it will just should mean it will discover many, many, many more. Uh, so this is exciting as well. Uh, that's a great story. Now, here's a wild one. There's, uh, it's about a giant tsunami waves on a massive star. And this is a massive star. Uh, it's a macho classification, massively compact halo object. It's in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and it has that numerical designation, but don't let that worry you. It's a blue supergiant star, 24 times the diameter of the sun, 35 times more massive. It's 160,000 light years away in the uh, LMC, as I said. It's 100,000 times brighter than the sun. And it has a companion, a smaller star orbiting it every 33 days. The thing about this so-called heartbeat star, it's called a heartbeat star because it pulsates. And this is an extreme example because in pulsating, the star's brightness changes by 20%, which is a pretty extreme example. We don't yet understand why these blue supergiants pulse like they do. But that's not the news. The news is that the smaller companion has an orbital period of 33 days. And every time it gets in its closest approach to the big star, it causes tidal waves on the larger star, pulling up material uh, and this material crests and breaks like a wave on the shore. And uh, these waves are pretty big. Do you want to know how big these waves are? You probably couldn't guess. These waves at their tallest are about 2.7 million miles tall or 4.3 million kilometers in height. So imagine a wave of star material being pulled out nearly 3 million miles and then breaking back on the surface of the star. This to me was the most mind blowing story of the week. The dark matter one was a good start, but this was just this was just crazy. You just cannot imagine that. Um, nobody's produced any animations of it yet. I shall keep my eye out for that and show you if, if they do. But what about that then? Waves of a star nearly three million miles high. Absolutely unbelievable. So uh, there was a, a lot of supercomputer work involved in simulating this, but apparently this is exactly what's what's happening. And talking weird things happening on stars, well, we thought we knew our sun. Are we getting to know our sun and its behavior? But it turns out we don't. Or well, there's something new. The sun is, emits for the sun a new type of light, 
And this light is high energy gamma rays. These are exceptionally high energy waves. They have an energy of about one tera electron volt, uh, which if you don't know, that is a lot. This is, the, this is gamma rays are the, the highest energy particles there are. And these are among the highest energy gamma rays ever seen. They've never been seen from the sun before. And they're being emitted not in small quantities, but in large quantities. This type of radiation is normally seen coming from accretion disks around black holes. We've never suspected that the sun emitted this type of radiation. And indeed, astronomers think that the sun shouldn't be capable of generating gamma rays of this strength. We have no, or say we astronomers have no idea what's generating these incredibly high gamma rays coming from the sun and in such amazing quantities. So there you are. So that's a lovely story as well. Um, what else we got going on? Well, SpaceX, uh, moving on to space flight now and rockets and things, SpaceX successfully, well, nearly successfully tested their uh, Booster 9 uh, this week, the Super Falcon Super Heavy Booster 9. It's uh, first full engine static fire over at Boca Chica in Texas. It was also a chance to test out the new water deluge system to stop the pad under the rocket being um, mined as the first orbital attempt did. So uh, they're desperate to protect the pad. So they've developed in very, very short time, just a couple of months, this incredible water deluge system starts off about six seconds before the booster fires its engines. In the event, only 29 out of 33 Raptor engines fired, or they fired, but they shut down early, and the test was aborted um, after about 2.7 seconds into its five-year, a uh, five-second expected duration. So, um, so it was a sort of success, uh, but the water deluge system uh, seems to have worked. And you notice the water has turned to steam. So these are white clouds, not the dust clouds normally seen at Boca Chica um, after tests. Um, and uh, the, the launch pad seems to have survived unscathed due to that enormous qu uh, quantity of water being sprayed upwards. So this was good. It proved that the deluge system works when it's uh, under the impact of those incredibly powerful Raptor engines. And there will be another static test before too long. So well done, SpaceX. They're well on the way now to a second orbital attempt, which will probably happen, I would think, sometime in September, uh, pending regulatory approval. So there we are. So it's great to see all that steam instead of dust. And as you can see, the clouds uh, of steam just, just uh, dissipated really quickly as well. So this, is, this was a, a real success, apart from the Raptor shutting down early. But I'm sure they'll fix that. So that was, uh, that was that. The Indian uh, lunar mission Chandrayaan-3 this week uh, inserted itself into lunar orbit successfully. And here are some photos it took that have been put together during its lunar orbit insertion of the, the moon passing beneath it. Uh, spacecraft appears to be doing well and, um, and it's due to, to touch down on the moon soon. And uh, it's got a rover and it will um, go looking for ice uh, at the south pole of the moon and do other experiments as well. But funny enough, this week Russia launched to the moon for the first time in nearly 50 years, the Russia Luna 25 mission. You may remember the, uh, the lunar series of spacecraft that the Russians sent to the moon in the 60s and 70s. This similarly is going to touch down at the south pole of the moon looking for ice. And um, and the spacecraft uh, had a perfect uh, launch and is on its way to the moon. This means that Chandrayaan-3 and uh, Luna 25, they're going to be quite close to each other. This is about 69 degrees south on the moon's surface. I'll give you some degree of scale. The, the crater uh, at upper left called Manzanus, that is about um, 100 kilometers across, 98 kilometers across. Luna 25 is going to win the race to the moon by the look of it, by touching down on the 18th of August. Uh, the Chandrayaan-3 should touch down around the 23rd, although both of these are subject to change, and indeed the landing sites are subject to change. But they'll be, you know, not much over 100 kilometres apart. Yeah. They go. Sorry? 
hello. <laughs> uh, if they if they land down where they're, where they're supposed to, they'll be a bit a little over 100 kilometers apart. It's good to have a space race at the moon again, but it looks like the, the Russians are going to win this one. Um, and then just a couple more things. As you may have seen in the news, Virgin Galactic this week launched its first all civilian tourism flight. And on board were a former British Olympian, uh, John Goodwin. He's 80 years old. He was Virgin uh, Galactic's first ever customer. He bought his ticket 18 years ago for um, £194,500. And uh, the tickets are now double that in price. So he had a good deal there. Also on board were a mother and daughter, uh, Anastasia Mayers and, uh, and her mother, Keisha Shahaf. And they won their tickets to go on the flight in a competition. Great. Uh, fantastic. I wish I'd known about that competition. Now, funny enough, um, Mr. Godwin described afterwards his experience as surreal. And in a big coincidence, this was exactly the adjective I used uh, the first time I took a virgin train. So, uh, so um, well done to Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin, unfortunately, does suffer with, with Parkinson's disease, but it demonstrates that you don't have to be a young, muscly, fit astronaut to go into space. And he, he enjoyed himself immensely, as did, uh, as did the two ladies. So there you are. Um, and the last item today, very quickly, Boeing have now officially lost $1.5 billion on the Starliner spacecraft, this spacecraft that was contracted by NASA to ferry astronauts to and from the space station. And uh, they received double the amount of money uh, that SpaceX got for the same thing. But this spacecraft has been a disaster with a series of really high profile failures. The latest ones where they found that electrical tape throughout the spacecraft was wrapped in a flammable material. Uh, will not be rectified until next March at the earliest. And it's about time somebody pulled the plug on this whole project. Boeing have lost this amount of money. And here's a look at how much money they've lost every year. They've lost this because NASA uh, sensibly had them on a fixed price contract. So any losses uh, they are paying for themselves. Uh, this is not always the case with space contracts, as we know. Quite often they have zero plus hours contracts where if there were any cost or, or time overruns, the taxpayer ends up paying for it. Well, this time NASA had Boeing by the short and curlies and said, no, we want a fixed price. You'll do it for this money. And if you don't make money, then you pay for it. So they've lost one and a half billion so far, thanks to this disaster of a spacecraft. So there we are. So that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is the news uh, for this week. I'm sorry it went on a bit, but as you saw, there was a lot to get through this week. That's an impressive newscast. A lot gone on. Well, there is every week. It's just, you know, it's, not, it's never a question of what to include. It's a question of what to leave out because it's, you know, just trying to keep up with everything is, is difficult. But, you know, there were several really exciting stories this week, especially the one about the tsunami waves on the star. That's just insane. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Yeah. What was the height of the wave relative to the diameter of the star? Oh, that's a good question. I don't actually know that. Um, I will find out uh, before the end of the show. And um, I, I'll ask Mr. Bard here. And, uh, and I, yeah, I mean, it's, it must be a fairly big percentage of it, I would think. But, yeah. wasn't there a, wasn't there a sort of a, a, an opposite story, if you like, um, from the Titan lander Huygens, and it discovered that in the methane lakes that the waves or the ripples were no no more than a millimeter, even if they were there. There was some, I, th I think it was about a no, millimeter. The, so you're it. absolutely right. It was a millimeter. It was a millimeter. And it's it's amazing to imagine, isn't it, a lake with you know barely a ripple in it? That must be stunning to what to, to stand it and look at. It must be so reflective. I, I would rather stand and watch a, a wave of less than a millimetre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, Absolutely. a little bit scarier. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, so a, 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 a big news week. Uh, I'm just going to let uh, Lou back in. He seems to have disappeared. Um, Daz seems to have stopped without trace for the moment, but I'm sure he'll be back. So, uh, so there we are. Welcome back, Lou. Sorry I had to keep you waiting. Thanks so much. Uh, I think I may have fixed my camera problems. I just want to say for the record, I have been a MOND enthusiast for years. We've been looking for these uh, uh, dark matter particles uh, using the best uh, super colliders we have on the planet. Can't find them. 
Yeah. Uh, I think at some point you have to say, well, okay, perhaps just like the ether, right? When we were looking for ether. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. then you have to say, well, maybe. It could be the ether all over again. So what? Well, so you must have been very pleased with the with the findings this week. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can't be sure. There's an emotionally, I guess, but as a good scientist, you just say, well, let's let's go find the truth. Um, it has always been the case. Uh, well, since since they started playing with these models that um, uh, Mond has more accurately reproduced uh, individual galactic rotation curves yes. than the dark matter. True. So, you know, there's some, there's some more evidence that perhaps that's what's going on. It would be fascinating if... But the thing is, if you look at supercomputer simulations of the early universe, if you don't add dark matter into them, you don't end up with the universe that we see around us. That that's you know for me that's that's the, the sort of the, it's that, been the sticking point. Certainly point. true. That is, and it's very difficult to um, not impossible apparently, but it's it's mm. difficult to um, uh, reproduce gravitational lensing with Mond. Yes, indeed. Um, so um, who indeed. knows? Indeed. Well, as I said, it could be a combination of both. You know, gravity may be more variable than we we think. It may have, you know, other effects than what we think in, in you know, specific circumstances. Yeah. No, so, but I, I found this really exciting this week that, that, you know, it looks as though, you know, Mond has been derided by a lot of people for many years because it's a, such a huge class of theories that you can, it's a bit like cosmological inflation. You know, you can tweak it, you can change the variables and the parameters to get more or less what you want. Um, but I think this week, this announcement about the wide binary accelerations is concrete progress towards coming up with an answer. So this is very exciting. Yes. I, uh, years ago, I was at a Goddard uh, Space Flight Center uh, Friday uh, uh, colloquium. Uh, they had the talks at 3.30 p.m. on every Friday in the summer. And uh, the speaker was talking about a uh, laser, um, uh, you know, gravitational wave finding system that would be launched into space. So that yeah. a number of spacecraft would fly in tandem at very close uh, uh, tolerances. And uh, she said nothing about MOND. So I raised my hand. I stood up. I said, could you comment on modified Newtonian dynamics? And she rolled her eyes and said, well, OK, nobody believes that. <laughs> ha. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there we are. All right then. Well, let's uh, let's move on. Um, Mark, for those yes. of, uh, for those of our viewers who haven't met you before, would you like to formally introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Why not? Um, so I guess I could describe myself as an uh, as an astronomer who's found a passion for sleep. <laughs> That's probably the best description that I can use. Um, a late passion for sleep and an interest in the world of sleep. Um, so worked on a show called Stargazing Live with the BBC, um, do lots of different bits and pieces uh, on TV shows like Good Morning Britain, Steph's Packed Lunch, even the Alan Titchmarsh show when that was still running, um, and spend my time spreading the good word of science, astronomy and sleep. Uh, so it's quite a mixed bag generally. Even when I was on holiday in Turkey recently, I found myself working. I went along to uh, a stargazing experience wondering what on earth they were going to do. Um, and I kid you not, all they did was simply uh, ask people to download an app on their phone and start looking around the sky to see what you can find. No. Um, and I, I kind of, I kind of sat there tongue in cheek a little bit, whimpering away at the sheer sh sort of shock of the of the whole thing. Um, but when someone said, "Oh, I can see Pluto," I stepped what? in. <laughs> and i started to guide people around the sky myself instead and they quite enjoyed themselves oh, um, so yeah true. i find myself doing it in all sorts of uh, strange places and strange times i mean doing that with people so doing that with people you know just getting them to download a, a sort of anti-outreach really isn't it <laughs> well, it's just just you know but with lazy, respect to the people lazy. you know who 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 were running the show they mm. were entertainers they weren't people who knew anything about astronomy but then the question should they really be offering a stargazing experience when they actually haven't got one good question good question controversial isn't it hashtag discuss yeah <laughs> and last time we spoke to you you'd just done your uh, guinness world record attempt 
to deliver yes. the longest uh, scientific lecture. It was, long, it was the longest lecture. It could have been about any topic. Sad oh, the longest lecture. Yeah, I, I didn't get the record, but it was on a logistical um, uh, failing. So uh, I managed to take uh, a sleep break before I'd actually earned all of the minutes. So you, you, you can take um, five-minute breaks every hour, or mm. you can batch them up and then take a bigger break later on. So I was batching them up. Um, and unfortunately, I hadn't built up quite enough time <laughs> to have the first sleep break. So, so, I, so I went into sort of sleep debt. Um, and oh. at that moment, it meant I hadn't broken the record, which, but you know what, is fine because well, I bet you were gutted though, weren't you? Uh, uh, do you know what? I, I was a little bit, but the amount of effort that, that a lot of people have put into it, um, mm. coupled with the fact that we learned some stuff about sleep, coupled with the fact that I now, you know, travel around talking to school kids. Um, I'm looking at some books about to, to write some books about sleep. I'm looking at a podcast uh, about sleep as well. Um, and I'm actually trying to spread the good word about sleep. Um, and I, you know, I kind of consider that a much better uh, result than, than just not getting a certificate on the wall. I still went for 140 hours and 45 minutes or whatever, or 45 seconds, whatever it was. So I'm okay with that. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've got the scars to tell, you know, for the experience. Yeah. Well, well, I worked to one and it's time, right. Well done. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it was quite Absolutely. quite a crazy experience. So, has have there been any sort of major findings um, to to come out of out of the sleep research? Because you were, for those that don't know, Mark was all sort of censored up and yes, uh, everything being measured. Yeah, so we were doing a number of things, and and a lot of the research is still ongoing. We had an, an EEG machine tracking brain activity. Um, I was check, uh, checking my temperature on a day on, on an uh, actually about a five minute basis. I swallowed some. Um, tablets that were thermometers that that pass through the system but send uh the temperature off to a little rece receiving station um uh, and also looking at my appearance and actually that's one of the bits of research that have started to uh be publicized where um there was a, a group of scientists in sweden at the university of, U of Uppsala, and they're looking at ways to predict uh what people or how tired people are not so much predict but to be able to tell visually how tired people are we've all seen friends and family and you can tell if they look tired and you can say to them wow you know you look tired you're okay um and this team in sweden are actually looking to see if they can develop an algorithm that can take someone's face from a a, a fully fresh state mm. uh, and then maybe a, a phone or, or or even a camera in someone's car could identify if that person's too tired to drive um wow. and they've they, they, i forget the numbers but if you have I don't know, 48 hours of, of staying awake, you, you age by, you visually you age by a few years and you can recover that through, uh, you know, sleep afterwards. But if you're tired, if you're sleep deprived, you look older than you really are. And they've, they've, they've put some numbers, around. I can't remember what they are now, but they've put some numbers around it. Um, and it, so it's really interesting. Yeah. And if they can develop some sort of algorithm, ultimately we could end up with cars telling us that we're too tired to be driving a car, which is a fascinating thought. It, it, and it'd be a major step forward because how many crashes happen because of people falling asleep at the wheel? I mean, it's just... it, you know, it's, it, it's a surprising number of accidents, and it, and actually they're, they're very comparable to people drink or accidents that, that that are caused by people drink driving. The reasoning, of course, is that if you're drunk and you're driving a car, you'll react. You might be slow at reacting, but you will still react. But if you fall asleep at the wheel, you just don't react at all. And mm. it's surprising that actually there's the, the numbers of accidents caused by sleep related conditions or issues um, in cars are say are comparable to to those people that, that are drink drivers as well, which is quite quite Amazing. quite frightening. Amazing, and I'm sure you must have uh, you know just by the, the the number of hours that you did talking about astronomy, you must have got some new converts and some some new people interested in it. Oh, I'm, I'm sure I have no idea. I'm sure I will have done, but I've got no idea. But yeah, it, it, you know, it, was a, it was a great experience. You know, you were saying earlier, I think that um, it's hard to be able to fit everything in when you're yes, talking yes. about space news. Uh, yes, but yes. I was lucky enough. I had five and a half days to fill stuff in. And, I was, and, and Rachel reminded me recently that um, when I was talking about the uh, Valles Marineras on Mars, and I have no recollection of this, but apparently <laughs> I, I, I likened it to Big Bird <laughs> off uh, Sesame Street. And I'm looking at it now thinking, I can't see that. What? <laughs> must have been hallucinating. What's that all about? I have no idea. But I hallucinated. You know, I remember yeah. there were telescopes behind me, um, and I was absolutely convinced that they were alive. Um, oh, and there's, wow. clips of, there's clips of me asking telescopes <laughs> to pass me hoodies because I'm cold. Um, 
and all, all sorts of and there was there was a tv on the stage as well and i was convinced there was a dwarf hidden behind the tv <laughs> and that's that's just by staying awake but actually and interestingly my my relationship with sleep has improved so much now and as an astronomer that's actually a really interesting sort of uh, conundrum isn't it because isn't it? Isn't i it? want to stay up late and see stuff i know that i need to get sleep so it's the way i do that now and the way i manage it is slightly different wow that's a, that's that's so interesting i mean you don't have to sell me on the idea of sleep i'm quite big on the idea actually but, yeah it's uh, important to be the interesting thing is that of all you know we've, we've had millions of years of evolution on this planet every living organism sleeps or has some form of period of time where they're you know not expending energy um, yeah. which you can liken to sleep yet the only organisms on the entire planet which are uh, which tend to fight sleep and try and stop sleep are humans because you know you sat at home on the sofa watching a new series on netflix watching space oddities live and you've been uh, up late the night before and you fight sleep to try and watch the end of it or you watch another series and we do we fight sleep yeah. and actually, it's so important to us that we really need to change our relationship with it yeah interesting yeah stuff. i was about to say i've got a seven week old fighting human downstairs yep. that definitely there doesn't want to sleep it's not easy <laughs> is it it's not easy but no. that you know that in itself once once you understand that they haven't developed that circadian rhythm yet helps you understand a little bit about why they are like they are um yeah. it doesn't help when it's two o'clock in the morning and you're sleep deprived <laughs> to be able to use that reasoning behind it unfortunately oh that's right that's right rachel sorry did you did you want to ask mark anything <laughs> Uh, no, I was saying I know obviously he's um, been doing his record attempt, but he's jaunting on a new path now. He's going on a new venture, so we wanted to know about your constellation pod. Yes, so it, it, you know it's, it's something I've been I've been trying to sort of play with, and getting the formula right has been a, a, a bit of a challenge. So I tried the pocket astronomer um, a, a year or two back, but I've I've teamed up with a, a, a wonderful production company in Birmingham. Um, and we've we've launched last week um, the Constellation Station, and we we angered and we ached for the or sort of argued about the, the title of this thing um, for for some time. But I think we got it right. And it's the concept of it simply is it's it's quick bursts of information that anyone can listen to, be it experienced amateur astronomers, professional astronomers, members of the public. It's just a quick five minutes, no more than that, of what you can see in the sky this week. Um, and you know, I've I've come from a place where at times you know it's, you just kind of lose track on what's visible. And actually, it's I think something like that has got a place that you can just dip into it. Um, it's released once a week on a Monday, um, and it just tells you what's coming up in the sky the coming week. So be it where the planets are, what the moon's doing, what the sun's doing. And as an astronomer, that's really interesting. Just knowing what time sunset is without having to Google it. Um, other search engines are available, I should say. Um, so the idea of it is a very simple, quick burst of information. We are going to be doing monthly um uh, podcast as well we're going to get some special guests in as well so we've got quite a good uh, lineup for that as well so it's quite quite an exciting uh, time coming up great and we'll put the link to that in the description of the video of course ah, uh, wonderful thank you comments here um sonia says uh sorry uh, sonia says that um if she fights sleep then she finds she can't sleep so yeah uh, yeah and, and and that does happen we have um a couple of different things in our body that that drive the need to sleep um and there's a there's a, a, a hormone that uh, a chemical change in your body um that builds up um and that, that's called the sleep pressure um but actually that follows the circadian rhythm a little bit as well so it, it does build up and it, it wanes or the drive to sleep wanes but but ultimately you know that sleep pressure will keep building and building and building and get successive peaks will get higher and higher um, and ultimately, you just won't be able to fight it anymore, and you just get very grouchy, and you end up needing to sleep. As we saw when I lectured for five and a half days, I got very grouchy at times. And to all those who are listening who are involved in it, I do apologise, and I have apologised to them all personally as well. Well, Daz says um, uh, it didn't help you getting a cold, sore throat, and blisters on your tongue. From oh, the do, you know, I, I, do you know? Do you know? I felt awful. I had a cold, um, and you know, of course, if you don't sleep it has an effect on your, I don't think that necessarily caused the, the you know, the, the cold in itself, but if you don't sleep, your immune system gets shot. Um, and yeah, I had this massive great blister on my tongue through talking constantly um, with, with the exception of the, the odd breaks th throughout the event. Um, yeah, but with a cold and a massive great blister and that affected my ability to eat, I just couldn't chew food because it was so painful. 
um, and I ended up going on on uh, a, a liquid diet for the uh, for for the last sort of three days. So it's quite quite physically as well as well as uh, sort of mentally demanding. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, excellent. Well, I dare say you won't be trying it again, but. Uh, no. but... <laughs> well we wish you all the very best of luck with your Thank latest you. venture mark and you know come back and see us anytime you, you know you will do of course here. always, always welcome. Pleasure. just drop in on a monday now you know where we are you can just drop in whenever you want to anything you want to tell us about or just be here with us and you know i don't know why you would want to but there you are but if you do uh, if you get sleep deprived of the fact that you want to be with us, <laughs> can't sleep um if you can't sleep come and um can come and uh, do it. Uh, Mick says, uh, Mick in Ireland says, uh, I was told recently that you cannot make yourself go to sleep. You only can let, let yourself go to sleep. Yeah, that, and that's true. You know, I, I couldn't now lay down and make myself sleep. Um, but but the, the, I could talk about this for hours. I know you've got to go, but I'm going to keep talking anyway. Um, you know, one of the really interesting things about sleep is that if you think about the three things that we need to survive, you need food, you need water, and you need sleep. If you, yeah. you you can very easily force yourself to not eat and not drink, but one thing you can't do is force yourself to not sleep, because after a while, and it you know generally within twenty four hours or so, um, it gets harder the longer it is. Of course, eventually your brain says, "I've had enough of this. You're going to sleep, and I'm going to take control now, and you sure. will be going to sleep whether you like it or not." You sure. can't, you know. I I had I would not have done it if it hadn't been for people poking and prodding and poking and prodding me to keep awake without that i absolutely would have gone to sleep it's as simple as that um but wow. no, you, you can't make yourself sleep but sleep will take you if it wants to <laughs> yeah and and i find as i get older because i'm a bit older than you mark i find that i have absolutely no trouble ever getting to sleep ever i i never lay awake in bed I, yeah I and, bed yeah. and i go to sleep and, and, and I think I've always been like that. I've never had issues yeah. sleeping. And I think, you know, I think insomnia is a really interesting thing because people's perception of insomnia is, is that it's it's a an inability to sleep. But the reality is, you know, if you're getting less than six hours of sleep regularly every single night, and, mm. and the amount of sleep we actually get is not the amount of sleep we think we get. Invariably, people underestimate how much sleep they actually get because if you're not getting more than five or six hours sleep a night, you will not be able to function in the days ahead. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And a lot of people think they have insomnia, they're not sleeping, but actually it's the perception of not sleeping. The, the real measure in all of this is, are you surviving? Can you get by in a day? And actually, I've had nights where I've just not been out of sleep at all, for, mm -hmm. you know, apart from the odd hour here or there. Yeah. But do I stress about it? No, because I know that my body will make me sleep if I need to. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one for people to manage, though. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, I know your, your time is short now. Uh, not literally, of course. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Where did you, that's news. Where did you get that one from? Heavens. <laughs> I mean, I know you, you've, you've got other things to do this evening, so we'll let you go. It's been um, a pleasure. Speak to you all soon. Yeah, take care of yourself. Okay, and, good luck, guys. No, come bye back bye. anytime. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. <laughs> so, uh, so, there's Mark. Um, now, Thank you all for your comments. Uh, we got some lovely comments. Uh, sorry we couldn't uh, show all of them earlier because I was busy doing the news. But um, uh, there, um, we're going to move on. Lou, last week you started a major presentation, a lovely presentation about the sun. Would you like to continue it, sir? Yes, I'm glad to do it, and your timing is perfect. Not only was I having camera problems that I think I have solved, but I was having problems uploading the file, and I just got it set. So good timing there. Oh, yeah, well, timing is my strong point. Uh, yes, ask my wife. A good leader so, knows how to do this. So, so <laughs> well, well right. done. Well done. There we are. There you go. All right. So uh, if you were with us last week, and I hope you were, uh, we learned five things about sunspots. And so I'm just going to remind our audience what we learned, and then we will move on from that. Uh, sunspots are very, um, they're very good uh, uh, reflections of how the sun works. And so we learned that sunspots are relatively dark, which is evident when you, if you look at them. They are cool. We can measure their temperatures about, uh, uh, well, let's see, Fahrenheit would be maybe six or 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I guess, something like a half to two thirds of the temperature of the surface of the sun. They are highly magnetic. We have visual and spectroscopic evidence of that. 
They are associated with solar storms. So solar storms, CMEs and flares often come off of regions where we have large sunspots. And the number one thing to know about sunspots is they come and go in cycles. So that's a, you know, it's a bicycle there to you know, remind you of your cycles. Get it, okay, okay. So, so that's what we learned last week. Uh, we, uh, we went over the various parts of the sun, the internal sun, uh, the core, the radiative zone, and the convective zone. Right, and looked at some interesting solar pictures. And I think this is about where we ended. This is a picture of a, um, from a spacecraft of a coronal mass ejection, a huge uh, explosion of particles uh, coming out from the sun. And what you see here is a, um, you see a, a circle in the middle. And this is a mask that the spacecraft put over the right side. From a spacecraft of a coronal mass ejection. Oh, wow. I'm getting, a, I'm getting about a four second delay in my sound. And what you see here is a, um, you see a, a circle in the middle. Let's see if you can. And this is a mask. This is about where we have to go to the right here. Okay. Nice sound. Oh, wow. I'm going to get a little bit of a sound. So we see a mask. Yeah. This is going to have to put over the um, yeah. uh, very bright. Uh, sun is photosphere. We've, we've still and got the 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 solar storms are uh, class A really powerful events that uh, many times are not directed at Earth, but when they are, uh, we can have some real problems. And this is the um, this is the uh, idea uh, behind much of what we call space weather. Okay, let's move on from this. So these particles from the sun are always streaming out in a, in a, a more subdued sense, and that's called the solar wind. And they are electrically, many of them, most of them are electrically charged. And therefore, as they move out, word from the sun, they generate a magnetic field, because we, we know this from the 1800s, that moving charge generates a magnetic field. So we have electrically charged and magnetically charged particles streaming out from the sun. And as they do, they their density gets weaker and weaker and weaker as they cover more and more volume, until the pressure that they communicate is so weak that it just balances the pressures from interstellar winds, okay? And that it pr produces a, a kind of a drop-off, a very quick drop-off that was theorized before it was observed, and we have now observed it uh, with the two Voyager spacecraft. And this boundary is called the heliopause, and it is the boundary between sun-affected space and true interstellar space. And again, the two Voyager spacecraft have now pierced this boundary and are operating in true interstellar space, sensing fields and particles uh, in the um, interstellar medium and then and sending that data for at least another few years back to Earth. Uh, we talked a little bit about the sunspot cycle. Uh, we also know that uh, in addition to this roughly 11 years sunspot cycle, as the number of sunspots rise and fall, and with them the number of solar storms rise and fall, that there are sunspots on other stars. In this upper right uh, graph here uh, with the blue and green um, uh, data points uh, is uh, a, sol a solar cycle from another star. So we, have, we learn about other stars by observing our sun, our star up close, and we learn about our sun by observing other stars. And uh, so it's a, it's a nice uh, kind of cacophony of, uh, of science that re reinforces each other. Uh, some more um, 
evidence of sunspot cycles here on Earth. If you look at the bottom graph here, it shows uh, four years of counting sunspots. Wouldn't that be a boring job to have? Mm -hmm. uh, but people do, and uh, uh, they have. We've been uh, able to do this for about 400 years. And uh, you'll notice that in the late 1600s, there is a period with essentially no sunspots for uh, a number of decades. This period of time was called the Maunder Minimum. And uh, I, I think Daz actually referred to this in his presentation. Uh, this is a um, just an indication of very low solar activity. We had thought that it was a uh, cause perhaps of uh, a mini ice age in Europe. Uh, which was and observing I, that. Yeah, actually referred to this in his But it turns out that that's probably uh, just a correlation, a, uh, not cause and effect. Just an indication Nevertheless, of solar activity, we have the ability to shut down a, its sunspots, uh, cause perhaps its sunspot of, cycle for uh, periods of decades, and we don't really know when the next uh, Maunder minimum is. Yeah, actually referred to this in his presentation. It turns out that that's probably just a correlation. We've got the echo back from your screen. The echo is back. Uh, cause okay, I wonder, uh, Andy, uh, that's got, uh, I've turned my speaker off, so I can't hear it, but it's got to be annoying. I wonder if I should um, postpone the rest of the presentation until uh, until uh, next week, perhaps, when we can get this ironed out. Uh, well, it's entirely up to you, Lou. What do you think? Um, well, perhaps we need to fix it before proceeding, yeah? I, I, I think so, and echoes can be incredibly disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just both for you and for the listeners, obviously. Yeah. So, okay. Well, if you don't mind doing that, Luke, no, come and do that next week. Let's do that. We'll pick up from here next time. Okay. Okay. Well, there. Um, just the thing about this more than minimum. Did, didn't I may have got? I may have dreamed this. Shows you how how I dream. Stupid. Um, didn't have, didn't they establish that the more than minimum was not responsible for the mini ice age? Yes. I thought That's so. right. It was just a correlation. They just happened to be going on about the same time. And correlation is not causation, as we know. Unless, except in quantum physics. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lou. We, we look forward greatly to carrying on with the story of... of we, we will soldier on next week. We will soldier on next week. If you need any technical help from me this week in fixing that, let me know, okay? Okay, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Luke. Right, well, this brings us to the big moment, of course, the moment we've all been waiting for. This week's gallery. And uh, have we, uh, uh, Roger, I think you are doing this week's gallery. Is this correct? Yes, I've also got what's in the night sky if we've got of time. Of course, of course. Unless yeah. Mark Thompson's going to be doing yeah, well, it. That, that goes without saying that we're going to do that. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, so let's have a look at the night sky and this week's gallery. A big thank you, as always, to our viewers who have sent in their gallery images much appreciated and i'm sure they will be of the uh, usual exceptional quality right what's up then Rog? right okay so here we go for the almost into the second half of august here we go but Doesn't have uh, fun. Well, well between last week and this week i've got this rather nice picture of the moon that was on the ninth it's become a bit of a rarity these lunar images so uh I have to grab it while I can, even though it's the same each month. So I keep getting <laughs> cold. Uh, this was the day after. So uh, these were these were taken during the daytime. Uh, well, this one was during the wee hours of the morning. But uh, yes, I've been getting some quite inter interesting ones. And here's one that was taken during during the daytime before uh, the inferior solar conjunction of Venus. It's got a bit of a, a bit of a glow round it, but it was a Quite a sight to behold once you can uh, find the damn thing. But uh, yeah, quite pleased with that. That's, that's the, lovely. That's the thinnest moon I've managed to catch. Yeah, or, yeah. Well, thinnest crescent of the uh, of Venus. Obviously, if if you time it just right, you can almost get it all the way around the disc. Wow, and Roger. There's there's structure in the in the in the um, I guess atmosphere on the left hand side of this image mm. uh al almost looking like uh, the detached haze layer and for pluto and titan well yeah, it was a, it was a very wobbly atmosphere lou so it's probably a, a, a sort of a sort of a after image almost okay all right 
yeah, I would be. Surprised. Although I, it would be lovely yeah. to wish that that was the sort of the the horizon line with some atmosphere above it, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, that is not the case. You've made a discovery, Roger. This is incredible. Mm. Yes. Where are the penguins? Yes, I want the my penguins. penguins. Yes. <laughs> anyway, you need to grass. Uh, I did manage to see the sun today, and uh, it's a bit um, bare at the moment, but. Uh, no doubt, uh, Lou will understand why we're get we're getting a maundry minimum on the on the sun today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So, uh, during tomorrow night into Wednesday, we'll be getting a new moon. So, uh, we'll be getting uh, some uh, waning waning crescents later on in the week, providing there's any clear skies, of course. At, uh, at the moment, we've got uh, quite an interesting uh, selection of uh, constellations with uh, Andromeda coming up nicely through the, uh, through the skies and obviously dominated by the summer triangle, Vega, Deneb and, uh, uh, and yep. um, Altair as well. Yep. And uh, as we shall see later on, the winter constellations will start to make an appearance. But this is drawing uh, 10 o'clock at night, and as you can see, Saturn is above the a uh, above the horizon. Although this year again, it's not uh, a terribly uh, high object to observe, so uh, you have to have pretty steady, good seeing conditions to uh, get a reasonable uh, observation of it. But uh, you can't do anything more. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kev says processing bright planetary limbs can produce an artifact known as edge rind, and mm, that, that yes. could be what you had. You can I probably know. get pills from the doctor for it, though. I, I'm sure. Yeah. Look at all. Yeah. Old, old, these days. yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> publication for you, Roger. Man. Sorry. Mm. Anyway, so uh, during a, during the night, this is at one o'clock in the in the morning. We've got uh, Jupiter coming up nicely, and as you can see, it's not too far ahead of uh, Taurus and the Pleiades. So uh, that will make a good photo opportunity later in the uh, later in the year. But uh, Jupiter is uh, quite uh, favourable for our, uh, the latitude when it gets up to opposition in December, but. At the moment, it's uh, becoming quite a nice uh, sight in the night sky. Saw it the other night. Mm, I'm sure you did. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, we've still got the Perseids through uh, through the rest of the through this week and into next week. Oh, what's going on? Roger, can I just pause you for a moment because uh, Dave has to to leave us. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, turn you off, so to speak. Oh, right. Um, so, uh, not you. Hang on. Let's put the thing away. Right. Um, so, Dave, uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. And we hope you're going to come back soon and tell us about uh, what's going on with telescopes and accessories and things. I will do. Yes. Uh, thank you. And if you're going to drop in, just uh, just uh, send me a WhatsApp beforehand so we can put you into the running order. Okay. All right, and thank you so much. It's been great having you on, on here again, and it's been such a long time since Astro Radio, but uh, good to see you're still well and healthy and, and happy. So uh, look after yourself, and we will uh, speak to you soon. Likewise. Take care. Goodbye, Take all. Care. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thanks to Dave for coming tonight. And uh, as we said, he will be uh, keeping us abreast of uh, telescopes and hardware stuff that's new on the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, in response to you uh, viewers who requested it. So there we are. We are happy to oblige. Sorry, Roger. Do carry That's on. quite all right. Anyway, uh, forecast in, uh, in uh, Sparkford, there is a, a good chance of some clear sky. So I shall try to get some uh, pictures of the Perseids. Oh, you what I did manage to get uh, a few nights ago. And oh. uh, we do have the Andromeda Galaxy up in the top left part of the image as well. That was a lucky shot. It was a lucky shot. I was just pointing it at them generally in that area, and uh, it just obliged for me, fortunately. But this was about the only one it managed to catch all night. 
So uh, hopefully there will be more available tonight to see when there's a more chance of clear skies. So you sure that you sure that wasn't SpaceX sign writing again? No, <laughs> no, there um, is a there is a satellite trail crossing the uh, meteor, but uh, that's as bad as good as it was. But that really adds to the photo. I think makes mm. it great. So we do have uh, a, a James Webb in interesting image here, where they seem to have found the furthest star um yet discovered and uh it was formed about a billion years after the uh, initial big bang so uh that can be quite interesting and yeah. here's a closer view of that it's called Arendelle, which is a bit um a bit hobbity lord lord, lord of yeah. the ringsy type naming but uh there we go so it uh, appears to be a massive B-type star, more than twice as hot as our sun, and about a million times more luminous. Wow. So and they've also discovered this week, they think that it's got a companion star of a red dwarf. Mm. So this is amazing. Uh, amazing. Very amazing. And we should live to see such things. It's amazing. Yes. We are so fortunate. Right. So here we go for the gallery. Stand by your beds. So the first one is from Lee. We haven't had one from Lee for a little while, and he's just done a planetary image of Saturn. So uh, he wanted to image Saturn as it's coming up to opposition. So uh, he used his uh, SkyMax 90 with a ZWA120MC with a times two Barlow. Okay, and here it is. Oh, nice one, Lee. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, with the rings being closing up more, it uh, doesn't appear so beautiful as it normally does. But uh, that's a still a great image, though. But he still he still got it. Yes. Yeah. Well done, Lee. Yes. Thank you for good. that. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Michael Murphy, who's doing a ISS transit, and uh, this is what we have. Oh, look at that. Mm. Not to be confused with the sunspots wow. that are also on the on the on the surface there. It, it looks like the suns are sleeping and it's going. Zzzz. <laughs> mm, yes, it is a bit like that. Yeah, some good groups of uh, spots there. Okay, Lovely. well done. That's and then we've got another, uh, another one from our regular Jerry Delay of Melot Fifteen, which is uh, another image that Rachel likes to do. So this is on his 100, 100 ED. With his 294, 25 five minute exposures. And this is what he has produced. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. Got some nice color there with the uh, background and the uh, and all that dust there. Very good. Right. Oh, no. Oh, not him again. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Move I thought on, we'd agree going to send in any more photos. Well, if I'm doing the gallery, I've got bragging rights. Yeah, that's true. You have. <laughs> so, this is this is going to be a rather colourful image, so I shall just quickly go over to it. And this is the Veil Nebula. It looks like a three, mm. one of those red, red, green, or red, blue 3D images. Mm. It's lovely, Roger. It's lovely. Yeah. Got some interesting colours there. I don't know how I managed to get the uh, yellow coloration, but uh, obviously uh, something something went funny, and I managed to get a, a more um, Wizard of Oz style image there. But uh, I love it. It's very wispy. Very wispy, yes. I've managed yeah. to. Uh, well done. So that was that was quite a, quite an interesting. Uh, That's a that really one. good image of the veil. You should be proud mm. of that one. Yes, I might I might get another metal print of that one. Well, not That's another metal great. print of it, but a metal print of it. Yeah. To, to my ever grain. So we've now got one from Sonia of Perseid Meteors. Over Hello, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we've got a compilation of several images here. So uh, this is what uh, she's managed to catch. Well mm. done, Sonia. Mm -hmm. mm. Well done. Yeah. I'm Hopefully jealous. There'll still be still be some left up in the sky if it's still clear tonight to uh, to grab some more. 
Yes, can I just say to our viewers, if you have managed to catch any Perseids uh, over the weekend or even before or after, any image of the Mises at all, send them in to us. Uh, addresses in the uh, addresses in the in, in the chat. But of course, as ever, it's spaceoddityslive at gmail.com. If you've got any Perseid meteors uh, recorded, we'd love to see them. Don't hesitate to send them in, no matter how, how bad you think the image might be. Uh, so do send them in to us. We'd love to feature them in the gallery. Mm. And uh, that's our gallery for this week. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody, as always, for sending your images in. We do appreciate it. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of skill and effort and patience above all else, both with the weather and while you're at the eyepiece to get these images. We do appreciate you sharing them with us because we know, you know, they're not easy things to take. So there we are. OK, right. So that's it. And uh, that would be uh, let me just uh, get rid of this as well. And uh, that would be it for this evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I uh, would like to thank our special guests this evening, uh, Dave and Mark, for being with us. Uh, as we said, um, we'll be seeing both of them, I hope, uh, on a regular basis. I'd like to wish Mark all the very best with his, uh, with, with, uh, with his, uh, with his new uh, podcast. And, uh, and I hope it all goes well. And, uh, and I, I must again apologize for the slight delay in my audio. And this is a problem that I've been discussing with the technical support guys this week. I was having a chat with about 40 minutes with them, and they can't find out what the problem is, but they're working on it. So hopefully my uh, my audio will be running at the same speed as the video uh, before too long. Hope it hasn't put you off at all. Uh, sorry to Lou for the uh, the technical problem you had with the echo on your sound, but we will do our very best to get that resolved, and we can carry on. What, what happens when you when you go live? Right. It's, it's always the perils of live broadcasting. Uh, we haven't got the luxury of being able to edit the things afterwards. Uh, so it is what, what it is. It's what we get. This is, so, this is the raw experience. Yeah. And uh, we'd rather do it like that because the live experience is always best. So um, we will get that sorted for next week and we'll carry on with your fascinating presentation um, about, the, about the sun. And um, well, just off the top of your head, Lou, what, what do you make of this discovery of these, these high energy gamma rays coming from the sun that are just completely unexpected? Well, when I hear high energy, what I think is high temperature. Mm, that's right. Um, so um, the question is, at what depth in this sun's atmosphere are they coming? That's, that's what I would like to know. Yeah, I don't and think even they know that yet. At that point, I think you can start uh, assessing how they're generated. Yeah. Uh, perhaps this is something in, in the corona. And we know Who knows? Coronal Who knows? I don't know. But very interesting. Very unexpected. Very unexpected. Yep. So that's uh, that's interesting. Just uh, just out of interest, these were detected using the Cherenkov water, uh, the high Cherenkov water telescope in Mexico, where the, uh, the, the, uh, the particle showers from the gamma rays hit um, uh, these uh, these tanks of water, which I think each tank holds about 200 metric tons of water, and they've got loads of them. But basically, it's Cherenkov radiation, as you might expect. Um, and, and this is where they detected them. And the, the astronomers involved, um, it was sort of a proving test for the telescope, and they thought they'd really mess building the telescope up badly because they, they couldn't believe the results. They thought there was a nasty hardware error or something, or measurement error, but it turned out to be accurate. So... Uh, Really interesting discovery. All right, then. Anyway, enough of that. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us tonight. Thank you for those of you who have bought coffees and T-shirts and everything else. Uh, we do appreciate you as an audience. We really do. We hope you all have a fantastic week. Stay safe. Look after each other. Have fun. And we'll see you back here uh, mm -hmm. at the normal time. Don't forget to check out the other videos on our channel. Our, our channel on YouTube has a lot of playlists. We've got all sorts of stuff from our Astro Radio days other videos we've done uh, here. So just have a browse through, through the playlists on our channel, and we hope you enjoy them. And mm -hmm. so it just remains to for the panel to say, uh, or bid you a good evening. Say good evening, panel. Good evening. Good evening, panel. Good evening. Good evening. And don't forget, the good Sky evening. at Night is on BBC4 at 10 o'clock tonight. Oh, oh, is it really? What Do you know what it's about tonight, Roger? Uh, black holes searching for the unknown. Oh, oh, that sounds right up my alley. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't watch it live because we haven't got British TV anymore here. Uh, but, Good old Brexit. Uh, yeah, somebody will upload it to the net <laughs> very soon, I'm sure. 
So, yeah, so thank you, panel, for being here, as always. Uh, Rachel, I hope Isaac lets you have some sleep at some point, as we've been talking about sleep a lot tonight. Uh, so, uh, so Fingers crossed. There we are. And, uh, and uh, sorry, Daz has disappeared not to return tonight. Uh, but he's like the Scarlet Pimpernel. He really is. He probably fell <laughs> by his face. So there we are. All right, then. We'll see you next week. From all of us at Space Oddities, have a fantastic week. And we'll see you again very soon. Uh, next week, in fact. So take care. And